Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. My name is Karen Larson. I am a program officer here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Thanks to everyone for joining us, especially our members for joining us this afternoon for Zoom for this particularly timely and important topic of election vulnerabilities. As you may know already, in accordance with the CDC guidelines and in the interest of public health, the council has made a decision to cancel all in-person programming through at least June 5th. Uh, that said, we are facilitating lots of great digital programs such as this one, and we encourage you to continue to check our website for updates on upcoming programs, as well as information about how you can continue to support the organization. Before I hand you off to our moderator and our expert panelists this afternoon, I just have a few quick housekeeping points. First, please know that this conversation is being recorded and we are live streaming. And secondly, just a reminder that the council is an independent and nonpartisan platform and the views expressed by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional views or positions of the council. We'd also like to highlight that this particular program is carried out in partnership with the Aspen Socrates program as part of the council's next generation work. The Aspen Socrates program is a forum for emerging leaders from various professions to convene and explore contemporary issues for expert moderated dialogue. And we'd especially like to thank the Aspen Institute for their help in facilitating and organizing this program. And lastly, and very quickly, if you have a question for consideration of the panel, please type ccga.live into your web browser and follow the on-screen prompts. Once you do so, you'll be able to submit your question and also vote for some of your favorite questions that have already been asked by members of the audience. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand the reins over to our moderator for this afternoon, and that's Mr. Peter Spiegel of the Financial Times. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and yes, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Spiegel. I am the uh, U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this is actually my first uh, time uh, moderating a panel on Zoom, so welcome to us all. Um, I must say we could not have picked a better day to do this. Uh, as everyone probably knows, as we speak, uh, voters are actually out in Wisconsin, uh, hopefully social distancing, but waiting in line after a pretty brutal uh, political fight between uh, the governor of Wisconsin and the courts, not only the state courts, but also the Supreme Court got involved last night over this very issue about whether we can actually hold elections uh, in a in an era of a pandemic. And so we have a great panel to do that on, on a very good day. Now, obviously, we, we set this panel up not knowing Wisconsin was going to do this for us, um, but it's obviously become an increasing issue um, as various states have been forced to either cancel or postpone their, or their uh, primaries. We here in New York have been postponed uh, from, from late April to, to June. Other states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Georgia, have done that as well. But it's not just the U.S. It, we've had elections in Europe, in the U.K., in Italy, in Africa, and Asia, uh, all who have been forced to, in one way or the other, either postpone or cancel elections. Um, obviously, I would also like to talk a bit about, about what, the, what the, the panelists are, were originally called together to discuss, which is election security more broadly, because obviously going into this election cycle, it was not a pandemic that we were worried about. It was more Russian interference, uh, the sense that our, our election system itself was under, under attack by a, uh, a sovereign power. So we'll get to that. But let me introduce uh, our panel first. But again, as, as Karen said, we'll talk here for about 40 minutes. Um, if you go to ccga.live, just put that in your browser, you can submit questions and, and Karen will feed those to us. But let me just introduce our, our panel very quickly, um, all of whom have, been, have long careers uh, in electioneering and running elections. Uh, first, uh, Karen uh, Whitney May, who is the co-founder and director of government services for the nonprofit Center for Tech and Civic Life where she leads uh, efforts to provide training and resources for local election officials. Uh, before that, she had served uh, at the uh, Durham County Board of Elections in North Carolina and worked for the New, Organi Organizing, in New Organizing Institute's Voter Information Project. Uh, Larry Norton uh, is uh, director of the Election Reform Program at the Brennan Center for Justice here in New York and the lead author of the book, The Machinery of Democracy, Protecting Elections in an, election world, an Electronic World. Uh, before that, before joining the Brennan Center, uh, Norton served as chair of the Ohio Secretary of State's Bipartisan Election Summit, and he currently also serves as vice chair to the Election Security Committee of the Election Assistance Commission's Board of Advisors. Lastly, Noah Pretz is the former director of elections at the Cook County, Illinois, and adjunct professor at DePaul University College of Law, and is currently a consultant on election security. He serves on the, uh, the advisory board of the Cyber Policy Initiative at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. With that said, let's get right into it. I, I would like our panelists, if they could, just to start actually with Wisconsin, because uh, surprisingly or not, this became a very partisan affair. We had a Democratic governor 
uh, who tried to, if not postpone the election, but at least try to extend and broaden the abil- availability of, of write-in ballots. Uh, we had a very conservative Republican uh, state legislature and a, a Republican-nominated state Supreme Court, uh, followed by a Republican majority in the U.S. Supreme Court who beat him back. And I, it's interesting to me the extent to which this has become a very partisan issue. And I wonder if, uh, if I guess just have uh, all our panelists sort of discuss what they've watched over the last 12 to 24 hours and to what extent that bodes ill, perhaps, about the ability to have a national consensus on how to run an election, mm-hmm. be it in November or be it in these primaries further down the line, uh, in, a, in a pandemic in which we might have to institute things like social distancing or even uh, write in ballots uh, en masse. So, uh, Whitney, why don't I start with you and if you could just address that. Um, thanks, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. So, I think... What we're seeing in Wisconsin is um, unfortunate. I think um, it seems like Iowa was like um, the new Florida and now Wisconsin was like, hold my beer, I got this. Um, So I think it's important to recognize that the election officials who are boots on the ground for democracy in Wisconsin, that's about 1800 local authorities. It's a highly decentralized um, state when it comes to election administration. Those are the folks who have really no or very limited authority over these policy changes that are happening last min- minute. They are simply responsible for implementing these policy changes. So we really see, unfortunately, those folks, Wisconsin voters who are sort of caught in the crosshairs uh, of these last minute decisions that are being made. Um, people having to choose between their own health and safety and casting a ballot. So my, my hope is that um, states moving forward use this as a, a, a lesson of not to be Wisconsin um, and to have policies in place that give election officials and voters time to plan. Noah, I mean, do you, it's a hope there. I mean, how optimistic are you? Because he's already heard the president himself actually out saying he's not supportive of write-in ballots. Um, you've heard the Democrats try to suggest that this is a, a path forward. You know, how, how optimistic are you that there is a national consensus on this? And if not, uh, what, what, what could November look like? Yeah, so my sense is that there, if there's a national consensus on anything, it's that there are going to have to be additional, uh, additional venues for voters. Now, in some states, that may mean everybody gets a, a vote by mail ballot, like a bunch out west. In other states, uh, more traditional, you know, election day polling place states, that may mean that instead of needing a doctor's note to get a vote by mail ballot, you can just uh, you can request it without any excuse. Uh, and there'll be states in between that are going to actively push their voters by sending them a, a pre-printed application uh, to vote by mail. And what this does is. One is it, it offers uh, some protection for the voters. Uh, it also decreases the burden. If you look at the lines, some of the things that are going on in Wisconsin today, Milwaukee, for example, down to a handful of polling places from maybe a thousand. I mean, that's simply just not what anybody is going to uh, be able to administer in November. Uh, so, so like Whitney said, I think the, the key lesson here is that elections are difficult to administer by the locals in the best of times, okay? Late changes to procedures and policies are just extremely difficult to get right. Difficult for the voters, they're difficult for the administrators. So uh, Wisconsin's unfortunate because the health situation on the ground was, you saw that coming three weeks ago, right? There was an opportunity to make changes earlier. Now it's true we don't know what we're looking at in November, the you know, epidemiological projections very widely, but I think deciders need to decide now. They need to take their best guess at the worst case, make policy decisions so that election officials uh, can, can implement and do their job, because they're really heroes working through this. Mm-hmm. Larry, let me ask you, because one of the things that you've heard the president say and other Republicans say about the move towards more a broader use of mail-in ballots so we can avoid uh, everyone gathering in one place is that it is more prone to fraud. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this is something that obviously the president has talked about uh, even just an in-person voting since he became president. But I'm just curious if you have thoughts on whether, to what extent uh, this holds water. I mean, some of the, the research I did ahead of, ahead of this panel says, yes, indeed, it is easier. We saw it in some of the, the North Carolina uh, congressional election where there was use of absentee ballots for fraudulent purposes. 
but that those examples tend to be uh, exceptions rather than the rule. I mean, do you have, do you have a view on, on absentee ballots, mail-in ballots as a channel for voter fraud and how, real, how prominent that is? Well, of course, the president himself uh, recently voted by mail, uh, as do many Americans. About 30 percent of Americans voted by mail uh, in, in 2018. Um, and Noah mentioned states out west. There are states like Colorado, Was- uh, Oregon, uh, Washington State um, that have had all male elections essentially for for a long time, uh, and where we haven't seen uh, haven't seen uh, fraud. Um, I do think you know there are there are measures that can be put in place, and we have a lot to learn from states like Colorado and Oregon um, to make these male elections as uh, secure as possible. Um, but I do think you know in some ways the the it's it's very odd to me, frankly, to see. Um, in in the past couple of weeks, a sudden a partisan fight over mail voting, because to my knowledge, uh, until a few weeks ago, it never has been. If anything, it was a geographic um, difference. Uh, In Western states, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, um, you tended to like mail voting. And in the East and Midwest, they they were more resistant um, to that. Fact of the matter is, whatever anybody in Washington wants we're going to have a lot more mail voting in this election. We saw it in Wisconsin. Wisconsin didn't change anything. Uh, they had 6% of people voting uh, by mail in 2018. Uh, that number went way up in this election. We have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people uh, that requested mail ballots, that, that voted mail ballots. So the question really isn't, are we going to have mail voting? It's, it's are we going to give election officials the resources um, to uh, run mail voting elections effectively. Uh, and that's a big part of where the failure was in Wisconsin. Uh, they just weren't ready um, to, to deal with the massive increase in mail voting. We've got uh, six months basically to get this right in the country. If anything, um, Wisconsin, uh, as Whitney said, is, is really a cautionary tale for us to, to get moving on making sure that we get it right in November. Whitney, let me ask you the same question. I mean, what what are the vulnerabilities for if we went sort of all postal, for lack of a better word? You know, what are the are there potential vulnerabilities there, both from election fraud point of view, but also for logistics? You know, as, as Larry said, it's a huge logistical change to start dealing with all these kinds of things. And also, if if you are aware, I'm just curious. I, I saw recently that uh, the Biden campaign has been spending a lot of time looking at the 1918 midterm elections, in which uh, there was the pandemic. Uh, the flu, the, the Spanish flu pandemic, elections were held, um, voter turnout was very low. I just wonder if there's any other lessons we can take from from either 1918, uh, the, the, the 1920 general elections, or elsewhere in the world that we can sort of, in some ways, you know, prepare ourselves for what what November might look like. Um, that's an interesting approach. I haven't dug into that data yet, um, but I'm thinking about the vulnerabilities of. Um, a huge increase in mail voting, especially in jurisdictions that don't have the infrastructure in place like Colorado and Washington and Oregon. I think it's managing hundreds, if not thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of paper and how to account for all of those and do reconciliation with those pieces of paper are going to be a huge challenge for election officials. And sort of layered on top of that is if social distancing is still a guideline that we're following in November, what does that mean for real estate for these offices as they're employing more people to manage all those pieces of paper? Um, yeah, what, what does the, uh, the ballot control process look like? I remember even during the Washington primary, which was, the, was at the early stages of the outbreak, there was requests for voters, please do not lick your envelope. <laughs> please use uh, you know, a sponge or something like that so it does not get passed on to election workers. Um, you know, no, no. I know this is not necessarily your area of expertise, but you know, we as we even just sort of planned our coverage uh, at the FT, trying to figure out how you cover a campaign that doesn't necessarily have uh, rallies. Um, you know, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, if you were advising one of the major campaigns, or you're not even on a, on a on the national level, but even on the state level or the local level, how you 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 strategize, how you work on turnout. I mean, these basic blocking and tackling that campaigns have come to to master over the course of, of, of well frankly the course of American democracy how, how do you how do you run a campaign 
um, that is so reliant on things like turnout, through rallies, through door knocking, these kinds of things in a current environment. Do you, do you have advice in that regard? Well, so I'll, I'll try to pivot into a lane I'm super comfortable in. And that's, uh, I think there are places where there's an alignment between the interests of campaigns and election officials. And that's in having a clear sense of how the election will be run in November, state by state. And the best way to get that are to get policy decisions made now. Uh, and as soon as those policy decisions are made, then the campaign apparatus can kick into gear in each state. And if it's all about getting out a vote by mail uh, turnout effort, that's fine. If a state has decided to increase their vote by mail from 10 to 50% and there's a decreased election day footprint, at least they know how to manage locally that operation. But those things cannot break late or things can be disastrous. The decisions can be made now. Um, that's in the interest of campaigns and them setting up a plan. It's in the image. It's in the interest of American voters uh, and certainly in the interests of administrators. Let me ask you, though, know, like, where does that leadership have to come from? I mean, as you note, our elections are run by state authorities largely. Um, so there is not a national authority that, 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 you know, the UK has or some of the European countries. Is it the national parties that have to show leadership? Is it individual governors that have to show leadership? If you are advising that we get this settled soon, who is the person that needs to take the reins on that one? Well, look, uh, in 40 of the 50 states, the chief election administrator is the secretary of state. And by and large, they're doing a great job. I know we tried to discuss at the beginning of this uh, sort of a partisan layering uh, to this. But, you know, I would just highlight um, the, the behavior of some of the great Republican secretaries of state in places like uh, Ohio and West Virginia who are leaning in. Uh, to help their voters to increase uh, vote by mail by making sort of uh, having good, strong leadership, making last, sec last second uh, rule changes, uh, because they know that their job is to serve their voters, uh, to stay out of the politics. Sort of that's the level of government where, where most of the policy recommendations will come from. How those are effectuated are going to vary widely across the state. Some will need legislative action. Uh, some can be done with extraordinary measures by the chief executive, you know, by the governor's office. Um, to the extent that there, there are legal changes that are necessary, that's probably going to have to go uh, up to the governor or to the legislature. But it shouldn't go there without the secretary of state and the local election officials association saying, this is what's possible. This is what we can do. Uh, let's get it done now. Larry, same question. I mean, is it the, is it? Do you think the role, as as Noah said, of, of each individual Secretary of State to lead on this? Would you like to see a a you know agreement between the national parties on that, or even you know Biden campaign, Trump campaign, as as unlikely as that is? Where do you think that this debate should be had so we, we make sure we get some of this stuff uh, in place in time? And also, if you have any thoughts on my other question, which Noah very uh, adeptly avoided, which is if you're advising the campaigns how to run mm -hmm. a campaign in the age of pandemics. Um, how do you do it? Because you're so relying on things like rallies and turnout and that kind of stuff, which you don't have this time around. Right. Well, you know, my, my personal preference, if if uh, it were up to me, I, I would I would see Congress set some minimum standards for um, how our elections are going to be run during this pandemic. Um, I, I, I think some kind of minimum uniformity um, is desirable because obviously I'm, I'm here in New York, but what happens and how people are able to vote in Ohio or Wisconsin is going to have a massive impact on, 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 on me and my fellow New Yorkers. Um, but I think that's probably unfortunately unrealistic. Um, and so I do think it is going to be, uh, at the state level. And, and we are lucky as Noah said that, um, while there's a lot of partisanship in the state legislatures and in Congress around these issues, um, for, for the most part, um, election officials of both parties, they just really want to make sure that their voters can vote and that they're running good elections. Um, and so if we do take their direction, I think we'll, we'll be in good shape. I should say um, one area where I do have hope on the, uh, on the congressional level uh, is that we get some more resources for the states. And I do think if, um, if the uh, questions around how we're voting is left to the states, that maybe there is the possibility um, that we get those resources because there is no question um, we can have all the changes and rules that we want at the state level. Um, states are hurting right now. Uh, and to expect them to pick up the extra tab, which um, at the brand 
Moon Center, we estimate it's going to be at least $2 billion to really run elections um, in this pandemic that, that um, people can vote in um, and where we can have a credible election. I think that money has to come from Congress. Um, Larry, can I just follow up? Because you mentioned that, that you'd like to see some minimum standards set on a national level. What standards for what exactly? Is it the time in which ballots will be accepted? I mean, what, when you say a certain minimum standards, like what kind of things would you like to see set? Like where, what areas do, do, would you like to see? Well, I, I mean, I think there are a few. One, one, I think, is we should be doing everything as a matter of public health um, to ensure that um, come um, November, I think it's November 3rd is the election day uh, in 2020, um, come November 3rd, that we don't have what we're seeing today in Wisconsin, that we don't have people that are standing on um, seven, eight hour lines um, and, and potentially risking their health to go vote, that we don't have uh, poll workers that have to risk their health. And to me, um, the way you do that is you make sure that every voter has the option uh, if they want to, to vote by mail, that you you increase the hours and the and the spacing out of um, voting in person so that you're, you don't have a lot of density in polling places and you don't have these long lines. Um, and that there's some kind of fail safe for people um, uh, if, um, you know, all these states adopting new systems and, and ramping up um, new systems, that there's some kind of fail safe for people uh, if they didn't get their mail ballot, that they can, they can, they can vote on something at the last minute um, uh, that, that will count. Um, so those are, just, those are just a few things. Another thing I should say is um, 39 states now have online voter registration. I'd like to see every state get that, right? It's not possible right now for people to go into government offices. We don't have regist voter registration drives. People want to update their information. They want to be register where, they're, where they now live. Um, you need online voter registration for that. So those are just some basic things that, uh, that I think, to me, they're just common sense. Um, it would be nice uh, if we could get kind of national standards at that, but at the very least, um, we should be pushing in every state for that individually. Whitney, can I ask you if you have anything you'd like to add to that list? Because uh, I think this is something that is, is worth trying to get up there. If, if there's a, we can all agree on a list of things that either on a national level or even a state by state level, we can all agree on. Um, but I wonder also if you could address a little bit the role of the court. So we talked about the, the role of the secretaries of state. What, what struck me perhaps the most of the last 24 hours is the fact that the Supreme Court in particular weighed in. Um, now, I, um, what I remember from my, my, my brief time as a election reporter in, in, in uh, Palm Beach County and Tallahassee during uh, Bush Gore was that the case law tends to be uh, judges and courts ruling on behalf of the voter, for lack of a better word, that, that expanding the franchise, maybe people are making sure that people aren't disenfranchised was always the, 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 the way that the courts tried to rule. This seemed to be the exact opposite. This was a, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I think, had a dissenting opinion here where she said, this seems to be actively disenfranchising people. And I'm, I'm curious if, if you all were struck by that as well, and what role the courts could play if we do not get this decided in, you know, the summer with, with at least some, some months to go before actual election day. So as someone who's not a lawyer or practices or studies law, I'm gonna punt that one to okay. Noah and Larry. Um, <laughs> but I, I do wanna to add to the list, um, if we're doing sort of a Dear Santa thing here, um, that, that Larry brought up for minimum standards across the states. Online voter registration should be a no-brainer at this point. Um, no excuse mail voting. We shouldn't require an excuse for someone to vote by mail. Um, early voting period, whether that's one week or two weeks, that should be kind of standard across the states to, to spread people out so we're not creating this um, um, single point of failure on election day for in-person voting. And then I would add to that paid postage. Mm -hmm. um, if we're sending out all these pieces of mail, whether that's an application to vote or just straight to the ballot, um, increasing their uh, postage budgets as well. No, since, I'll, since I gave the, the, your two fellow panelists a chance, you want to add this, the Dear Santa list and also if you have any thoughts on, on the role of the courts, I'd, I'd be welcome uh, your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll come back to that. You know, first, uh, just to finish up the administrative side of things, you know, Vote by mail, uh, rotating to there comes uh, with significant operational challenges. So uh, thinking about bringing in entirely new infrastructure, hiring a whole new set of vendors to do inline printing um, and mailing it out to voters, the cybersecurity uh, challenges that, that come with that, bringing in new technology to sort mail ballots, the, to open them up, 
uh, to do some automated signature capture. This is technology that a lot of election officials don't rely on currently because they're able to do it with uh, a manual kind of brute force method. Uh, the larger jurisdictions are failed with are, are faced with bringing in significant new technology, and that comes with one significant operational uh, risk because change is tough to manage, and we've got a date certain in November. Uh, two, it takes uh, a lot of focus. Focus that you know, unfortunately, in the current uh, world environment, we still need election officials to be paying attention to foreign adversaries, both on. Um, the information side and on the cyber side and bringing in new technologies opens up a whole new suite of, uh, uh, of cyber issues. So uh, I think it's really important to, to recognize that even if we send out mail ballots to everybody, that's protecting one portion of the process. Um, but in a lot of places, all those workers are gonna have to be brought into the back office <laughs> to open mail ballots uh, manually to feed them through uh, precinct scanners because there's just not the supply chain and the funding uh, to ramp up the technology that's necessary to do it, you know, best case scenario. So there remains a tremendous amount of operational risk uh, in the elections environment with these changes. That brings risks to people's sense of uh, legitimacy in, in, in the process, which is why I, I personally am sensitive to election officials that may not want to make the huge leap from uh, fully precinct based to uh, all vote by mail. You know, you need to bring your voters along in a sense of time. But uh, but I agree with my uh, my friends and colleagues on the on the panel that, um, you know, giving the opportunity for voters to, to vote by mail or vote earlier or vote in, in precinct is, is really important. Uh, with respect to um, the courts, I would just say that there were opportunities uh, Legislatures and governors need to lead right now. I mean, they've got the power uh, to set the rules. They've got the, the time to do it. If they had done so, this probably would not have gotten to the court. If a lower court judge hadn't left um, sort of a little bit of leeway as to when the actual election was, it, it, it may not have gotten there. Uh, I think um, I started in the business in 2000. It, it's what hooked me. That's why I went to law school. That's why I teach election law. Um, this will be a fascinating case to teach for years. Uh, it is very unfortunate when um, there's public leadership failures uh, that ultimately lead to uh, the judiciary getting involved. No, can I ask you though? Am I wrong in the case law here? Again, my my you know 2000 is the last time I really focused on this with any, at any length, but. What I remember from trying to write some of the stories about the court cases in Florida was the history has been traditionally that the judges try to keep the window as open as possible, that, that always err on the side of making sure everyone's vote is counted, which seems to have been the exact opposite here. Is that, is that a, a fair criticism, a fair analysis? I think that that's uh, a very noble place to um, jurisprudence uh, starting point. Uh, I do think there were a, a couple of tenuous holes when you don't know when the end of the election uh, period is. I mean, when folks have vote by mail rules, either in some states, they've got to be in your possession on election day, or they've got to be postmarked by election day, because election results started getting published on election day. Um, you know, it's a very difficult place where you've got a, a close election. Um, and the voting period, and it's public, and the voting period is, is still open, and campaigns are now hounding voters to cast a ballot that they can still cast legally. I mean, it's, it's important to be uh, clear and finite and set a set of rules that, that everybody plays by. Um, unfortunately, again, those rules, you know, had to be they, good folks for good reasons tried to change those rules at the um, – at the end, mostly it exhibited failures of leadership uh, earlier because, you know, this, <laughs> what we're seeing today in Wisconsin was predictable three weeks ago. Whitney, can I just go back to you very quickly? Because because I think your remarks and, and Noah's follow on is a very nice segue into what we we're originally going to talk about, which, which is sort of cybersecurity, because it does raise, you mentioned the issue of, of online voting. I mean, this has been openly discussed, I know, in Europe, where I spent quite a bit of time as a reporter. Um, why not online voting, for lack of a better question? I mean, the fact of the matter is, this would be moot um, if we were all voting online. Um, you know, we wouldn't need worry, have to worry about social distancing. We'd have to worry about counting, even from the, on the, on the, the operations side. Um, 
is the biggest issue a security issue or is, as Noah said, is the bigger issue the almost the, the public communication issue, bringing your voters along to that narrative that you're not showing up and pulling the big lever and all that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, I think those go hand in hand. Um, I think we're not voting online um, because the internet as we know it today isn't secure enough for us to assume the risk, in my opinion, as an electorate. It's about, our, it's about how risk tolerant we are uh, because the internet is not 100% secure. And I know people want to say, well, I bank online, I do my taxes online, and I book travel. And like all of those things have sort of insurance mechanisms when something bad happens, um, a way to get your money back, for example. Uh, we don't have that for elections. And I don't think as an electorate at this stage in 2020, we're ready to assume the inherent risk of internet voting. Now in 10 years, when the internet looks completely different than it does now, I imagine we'll continue to have this conversation, but in 2020, I don't think the American electorate is ready to assume the risk of online voting and make that trade off. And Larry, same question to you. I mean, even if we were to extend this to, to again, look back at where we were after 2016, um, uh -huh. Are we, do you see any progress to where we can get to a point where pure online voting through Zoom or whatever um, is in the near future? But talk a bit also about what we think we learned about electronic voting even in person, where we did see signs that, that the Russians in particular were trying to get into individual companies that were providing elections machines. Um, mm -hmm. how, how secure is the system as it is now? And is there a place where we can get either four, eight, 12 years where something akin to you know, online voting is, is actually doable? Well, I, I think what happened in 2016 is the best argument that, that I could think of for why we shouldn't have online voting at this point. Uh, as Whitney said, I, I just don't, we're not in a place where we could make that uh, secure. And, and voting is different than a lot of other things, even registration. You register, that's a public act. You can check your registration. Other people can check your registration. Um, we don't want to live in a country, I don't think, where, where everybody knows your vote. Um, we have a secret ballot, and that makes the, the security issue um, much more challenging. And we know um, that there are foreign, hostile foreign state actors, among others, who um, would like to interfere in our elections. Um, and so the idea of, at this point, um, putting our elections and the, the vote online, to me, just seems uh, way too risky. We made a lot of progress. Um, I don't think there's any question since 2016 in securing our elections. Um, one of the things uh, is what you mentioned um, uh, with, with electronic voting machines that we use in person. Um, compared to um, 2016, there's been um, a big drop in the use of paperless voting machines. Um, that, that was a security risk that um, cybersecurity experts have identified for a long time, the bipartisan um, uh, report from the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, many others have said um, that's an unnecessary risk because for the reasons that I mentioned, because these are electronic machines, the ballot is secret. If you don't have an independent paper record, there's no way to check it. So that's just one example. I think in general, the elections community um, since 2016 has been paying a lot more attention to security. Um, uh, we've gotten um, election infrastructure uh, is now critical infrastructure in the United States. Uh, we have the Department of Homeland Security that's been very involved in um, making sure that our election systems are more secure. So I don't think there's any question. Uh, we made a lot of progress on that front, maybe not as much as is ideal or that I would like, but, um, but definitely lots of progress. Noah, on the same topic, I mean, earlier you spoke very passionately about the good works being done by the local officials, be it the Secretary of State, but even on the precinct level to ensure uh, elections go off uh, with, with minimal hitches. Um, it is, I would argue, I guess, both a, a positive and negative thing about the American system in that we have this hodgepodge of election standards, because when you look at going to electronic voting or at least machine voting, um, it both brings security and vulnerabilities, right? It is secure in that because there are so many different systems, it's hard for a, a bad actor like a, a foreign sovereign to come in and hack the entire election. On the other hand, trying to set national standards or at least uh, make sure that all voting machines have a level of security that we're all comfortable with, it's impossible to set those kind of national standards because of it. And I'm curious just what, what your thought is. And again, I, I come at this slightly having spent the last 10 years in Europe where there are 
centralized national standards on these kinds of things. And you come to the U.S. and you realize how sui generis it is. Do you think that this sort of decentralized standard setting, particularly when it comes to electronic voting machines, is a positive thing or something that hinders our ability to actually secure our elections? Sure. Well, uh, it's a pretty layered uh, question. So, so there are some baseline standards that are that are voluntary, which most of the voting equipment vendors uh, meet. Now, they haven't been updated in you know a decade and a half. Uh, so, in fairness, that's not much threshold at all. Um, <laughs> but but there, there's a federal uh, agency, the EAC, who who works and are they've got a group and. Uh, Larry uh, sits on one of the boards that are about to adopt uh, new standards, hopefully, which you know should allow all the equipment that are built to the standards uh, to be up there. So, so that's good, even though uh, there's a wide variety of different technologies being being used around the country. It's uh, you know I, I, I come from Chicago um, in California, but in studying elections over the last few well, 20 years, really. I mean, I come to appreciate the fact that before there was a federal government, there were uh, a bunch of states and um, they, they ceded some uh, power to them, but they hold closely their uh, authority over, over running elections. There's something to be said in our country about um, bringing uh, the administration of government uh, as low as possible. The, the data is pretty significant that uh, voters, that citizens, um, respect the the closest level of government to them. Their their cities, uh, you know, then their states, the, then the federal government, their state legislatures, you know, then their statewide elected officials, their county clerks that run elections uh, uh, first. So, because there are two virtues in my mind in elections, right? You've got truth and trust, um, and because trust is given to that local election official uh, before it is uh, any other layer of government. I think this, the way we administer elections here is, uh, is very important. But I use those two things to talk about the internet as well. Um, even if it could be made secure, um, you, you can get to true elections, true results, but can you ever trust them? I mean, in our country, when we got polls tearing at the fabric of you know uh, uh, our sense of self. Um, will they ever trust uh, the results that they can't tactilely uh, prove? And if they can't, what difference does it make if they're they're true or not? Um, th th this this institution is is the foundational one. It's it passes legitimacy on to everything else. If if the virtue of building trust can't be um, you know, the most important one that we've got to protect, uh, then it's probably, you know, it's questionable uh, what the rest of it is that we're doing. Um, and the hard part is on the, on, the, on the trust front, the American public, the voters and the candidates are the kind of, they're the front line. They're the ones that are being uh, attacked by, you know, foreign adversaries and, and domestic troublemakers. Uh, you know, they're the ones that have got to, um, the biggest vulnerability I see right now in the institution of, of elections is our sense of trust in them and in the outcomes um, and in all the institutions uh, built on top. Whitney, sort of same question about the extent to which our hyperlocalization of our administrative elections, whether that is a net plus or net minus in terms of security. But I wonder if you could also maybe uh, add a layer onto that, which is, you know, we saw, at least reported, you know, after the event, that there was at least a handful of efforts by the Russians and others to actually get into, uh, unsuccessfully get into, you know, local voting machines. Um, I'm just curious, we, we've heard from DNI's office through leaks and whatnot that they are still remain incredibly fearful that this is not only ongoing, but perhaps escalating. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts about the evidence of that thus far, whether you've seen anything credible about the threat that we've either seen over the last couple of months, the threat going forward, uh, what, what you see uh, as, as the activities that are even going on as we speak to try to undermine that, uh, that trust that, that Noah got at. Um, so as it relates to the decentralization of election administration in the U.S., I think depending on which day of the week it is, it could be a bug or a feature. Um, I lean towards, well, I don't know. 
<laughs> I, I, I go between both, uh, to be quite honest there. Um, as we're thinking about election security, especially during a global pandemic, I think it calls each of us to really make some choices around uh, what is important and what is urgent, right? So election security continues to be important. Um, but what I hear from election officials in our network is the urgency around the health and safety of their workers, their voters, um, and probably by extension campaigns, just in general people in their communities. Larry, let me give you the last uh, answer here before we go to the Q&A on that very subject. I, I guess, I mean, I, I, as Whitney said, the, the front burner issue is whether we can run a safe campaign in the, in the age of a, of a pandemic. But I'm still curious about this, whether you have seen credible reporting either through open source or otherwise that the threat to the actual voting system is real, whether this is a target for foreign adversaries mm -hmm. and how worried you are that we are still vulnerable in that regard uh, in terms of the ability to, to have a, a multiple voter systems, election systems that are, that are, are secure. Look, I, I... The fact that we have this global pandemic doesn't mean that uh, the Russian government or or anybody else who might have been targeting our election is suddenly going to stop thinking about doing that. Uh, in some ways, if anything, um, we may become more of a tar an appealing target uh, under these circumstances. And as Whitney said, um, I think unfortunately, um, by necessity, um, there's been less attention um, to the election security issue um, than there was just four weeks ago. Right. I think for election officials four weeks ago, probably the top thing, if you ask them, that they were thinking about was making sure that um, their elections were um, secure and protected from cyber attack. And that's um, that's probably fallen a little bit over the last few weeks in, term, in terms of figuring out just how to run uh, a credible election, ensure that they're protecting um, all their all their voters and their and their election workers. Um, I don't I don't think there's to me, there's no question. Um, that our elections were targeted in 2016, um, maybe to a lesser extent in 2018, and that 2020 is something that we have to worry about. And I think um, I'm hopeful uh, that, you know, after the, the next few weeks where I think we can only really be focused on how do we make sure that we can run um, credible elections this November, um, that we are able to divert some of our energy back to the question of, okay, well, we're now changing the way we vote. Um, maybe we need to also refocus on how we're securing our election. So some things that we may not have been paying as much attention to, like um, sy you know, online systems that allow you to apply for a mail ballot or the online voter registration system, um, that we start paying more attention to ensuring uh, that they're secure. People working from home and, and performing tasks um, that are critical to security. Those things too. I think we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, it's probably not the conversation that most election officials are going to want to have in the next two weeks, um, but I, I think that they're, they're going to know, and we all know, that it's, it's something that we're going to have to be working on over the next few months. Peter, can I add one point on top of what Larry? Yeah, please there? go ahead, Noah. Save me here while I, I log on. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so I do a lot of uh, the consulting with the cybersecurity agency inside of DHS, and our job has been, or their job has been, to support local election officials in the uh, in the election security arena for the last four years. Um, and, and the last month has been spent almost entirely on helping gather the, the best information uh, we can gather to get to election officials about how to operationalize the changes that are coming. The whole sort of support community is doing that so that they can quickly move uh, to what they're gonna do in November and we can get them to refocus on, uh, on election security. All right, um, I now have the questions in front of me. Let me start here with um, a, an issue that we, we, we danced around slightly, um, but I think it's worth revisiting. Um, how are the states gonna actually find enough people uh, to work on police stations if we still have a pandemic? I mean, this gets to the issue, Whitney, that you were talking about, which is the urgent. Um, uh, just curious if you could address that, and then obviously if, if any of the panels wanna weigh in as well. Yeah, I think um, that's one of the success stories, maybe that's a stretch, but coming out of Wisconsin uh, was their partnership with the National Guard 
to bring in Plains Clothes National Guards folks to be poll workers um, throughout their communities in Wisconsin. So I think there's, this is an opportunity for folks to get creative, to tap into partnerships that maybe they haven't explored before with uh, targeting populations that might be less vulnerable to severe symptoms of COVID-19, because traditionally these are um, people who are 70 plus who are working the polls, and that's, I don't think that's um, a good path forward. So thinking about partnerships with schools, uh, with the National Guard, with colleges, uh, and local businesses as well. Now, yeah. Larry, have you seen other examples out there? Yeah, I, I think in Ohio, um, uh, the Secretary of State, before the election was canceled, entered into some um, uh, partnerships with um, to, to get um, college students and, and high school students uh, in the polling places, as Whitney said, less vulnerable populations. And I, I do think uh, Whitney's right. Um, uh, officials are going to have to be creative in finding um, new poll workers. And frankly, it's probably a good idea to be overstaffing um, polling places because you don't want to be left in the situation um, like we saw in um, Milwaukee today or in Chicago uh, just a, a, a few weeks ago where you, you can't run the polling places because um, so many people cancel. Um, so getting getting more people, getting a more diverse pool, I think is going to be um, critical to, to running polling places in November. I think it's important to, to consider as well as states ramp up vote by mail, part of that is uh, to serve their voters. The other half of that is it, it brings in the ability to shrink the footprint a little bit. Um, perhaps the number of polling locations that are staffed, um, you know, as the, as the demand decreases because it's being filled on the vote by mail side. And with that, you can, um, you've got less of a recruitment burden, but there are all, all sorts of things uh, to think about. You know, financial incentives certainly uh, work. When, when pay goes up, uh, people continue to work. So most of the country is nothing near a uh, $15 minimum wage for an election day. That uh, These are $100 uh, uh, jobs and they probably ought to be $500 um, jobs. So. They're going to be, um, there's going to need to be some uh, financial investment. I think it's also important to recognize that um, while well, looking at the epidemiology of this thing, that a lot of people will have um, come through it uh, on the, uh, by the time November comes, uh, the, the antibody tests uh, should be rolling out soon, we hear, which are going to um, allow people to recognize whether they've been through it or not, which can open up. Uh, people to get right back into society as we've always known it. Uh, so my sense is we're going to be in a little better place in November, either way, when it comes to the ability to, to recruit people, just because of the knowledge uh, will be a lot better. Let me try to combine two of these questions here because they're both on the, sort of the same topic. One, the, the top vote getter thus far has been focused on Trump himself, that obviously he has been someone who over the last three or four years has talked about credibility of elections and fairness of elections and, and, and whatnot. Um, there appears to be some concern amongst the audience about whether he now as president has authority to, to do something about it, uh, I guess in a negative way, uh, to raise, uh, to, to intervene uh, as a government authority to, to affect the fairness of the election. Um, it, probably the case, no, because we, we, as we talked, it's mostly run by, by local authorities, but if you could address that. But also, interestingly, the question about um, to what extent you anticipate uh, you know, obviously, we've seen a lot of attempt to influence election by foreign actors online through social media. To what extent you anticipate that the fear of uh, the pandemic will be used by foreign adversaries, either through social media or fake news or whatever you want to call it, propaganda, to either suppress turnout, affect the election, affect turnout? Um, and again, uh, Larry, since uh, you were you were just uh, let me rotate the first person to aim the question at. Let me aim this one at, at you. Those two things. To what extent do you think that Trump can actually intervene uh, on, on on fairness issues in the election? And to what extent do you anticipate that foreign adversaries could use the pandemic as a, a propaganda tool? So, so um, on the first question, um, a lot of people I've heard express concerns that like maybe the president will cancel the election or use emergency powers in some way to do that, and he can't. So that I, I think that everybody should know the, the date uh, of our uh, it's going to happen in November, our election. Um, and the only way it can be changed is if Congress and the president agreed to change it. And that seems very hard to imagine. Um, uh, in terms of uh, I, I would say both on, you know, 
other things that that the president or somebody else might do to make it um, difficult to vote or disinformation around the elections. I think this is why, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be, you'd be naive to think we might not see some of our foreign adversaries using um, the, the the pandemic to scare people around voting. I mean, that's, and to try to undermine faith in the election. Um, I, I think for that, for, for, or for domestic actors, the key thing is to have lots of options for voters. Um, so that if they are scared to go to the polling place, they have some other way of voting. Um, if they don't trust the mail voting, that there is still an in-person option for them. Uh, that if they don't want to show up to the DMV to, to register, um, that they can do that online. The more options we have, the more flexible we make the system ahead of time, um, the more unlikely that some kind of shock, wherever it comes from, to try to um, undermine the election uh, is going to have a big impact. So again, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself, but I think that's why these next few months are going to be so critical um, before we know what's going to happen um, to to um, putting us in a better place to absorb those kinds of shocks. No, and any any thoughts on on to what extent the president himself, as a now a elected authority, can somehow intervene to 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 raise uh, fairness issues in 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 the general election? Uh, no, I mean, I think Larry's sort of legal analysis was, was right on there. Let me ask, um, the, there is a, another question here about, you know, obviously all three of you advise us all to uh, authorities in, in, in the various states to get their act together quickly. What happens if not? What happens if we are in November uh, and we face a Wisconsin situation where we were having lines that people are having voting, uh, you know, forced to wait hours in line? Um, um, what, I mean, obviously you're not epidemiologists, so there is, there is potentially a, a health risk, but the question is, is, is how does this benefit, uh, uh, either party politically? Is there, is there, given the, the partisan nature we've seen the fight thus far, do you see that there is a partisan advantage for anyone to, to advocate that we, we, we go, we retain the current system that everyone's, uh, in person voting? Um, Whitney, let me let me try you. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so I'm always curious when we are in situations to think about who benefits and who suffers, who benefits from chaos, and who is hurt or left behind during moments of chaos. And I think in a year or two years, it'll be interesting to look back and look at the data and study that. Um, I think in if we look towards our leaders and what they are able to do or what they fail to do before November, there are still things that we as individuals um, can take responsibility to ensure November's elections are as successful as possible when it comes to fairness, inclusion, and accessibility. So I want to use my time, if that's okay, to um, have some asks for people tuning in. So I would ask everyone who is eligible to register to vote before, well before November, um, to make sure that your voter registration data is up to date, especially mm -hmm. your address. I would ask that you double and triple check your source of election information before mm -hmm. sharing it online to make sure that it's accurate. Um, if you're able and comfortable, sign up to be a poll worker in your community and encourage others to do the same. And I ask that all of us just go ahead and be prepared for uh, the potential that we don't have election results on election night. And I think that's really important for us as voters um, and for the media especially to go ahead and right size your expectations around okay. election night, potentially not knowing the outcome because of um, an increase in mail ballots. Larry, I know I will give you the same opportunity. We only got about five minutes here. So when I give you each sort of an opportunity to sort of give your, your final thoughts, if you do want to address this question about, which I find fascinating, because I think, Larry, you were saying that this until, you know, recent weeks, we didn't actually see mail-in voting be a partisan issue. And I, I just wonder if the assumptions being made by, frankly, by both parties really uh, play out. But, uh, but if, if you could address that, or if not, if you want to just uh, have some final thoughts about uh, what the next six months might look for, uh, I'll give both of you uh, sort of closing remarks here, Larry and Noah. Yeah, you know, um, it's not at all clear. It's it's a, I, I find it very strange that um, this discussion about around um, uh, making sure that we can run credible elections this November and the support that states and locals need to do that has become uh, partisan. Um, I, it is not at all clear to me um, that um, the situation that we we have in Wisconsin 
uh, today, if we had that around the country in November, it would benefit one party or the other. And in fact, I, I think one thing that we can safely say is that it would not benefit the United States. Uh, that um, when, if you have a situation like that where um, uh, the election doesn't look legitimate, where it looks like people didn't really have a chance to vote um, because they were worried about their health, um, that it wasn't the that it wasn't administered fairly, um, that. Uh, that serves um, the interests of those who who don't want to see a strong uh, country. Um, that 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 really, regardless of who ends up winning that election, um, there are going to be questions about the legitimacy of that election. And I think that's very bad for the United States. Um, uh, you know, uh, in terms of what the next few months may look may look like, to me, um, and I, I said this before, but a big part of this is is resources um, and ensuring um, that uh, I, because I do believe that almost all election officials want to run good, credible elections where where the people that they are serving um, get to vote. Uh, and the question is, are we going to give them the resources uh, to do that? And frankly, I think that's going to play out in the next month. I think it's going to be sooner than um, before November. I think we're going to know in the next month whether or not um, Congress provides the resources for that. Uh, and if they don't, um, they're coming back on April. Um, states and, lo and, and local election officials, I'm sure that they will try, um, but to be able to do everything they want to do to ensure we have credible elections in November. Noah, I will give you and your fabulous fireplace uh, the final word. Well, well all right, then, uh, thank you. This, is, this has been an excellent uh, conversation. I think as the profession, as a, as a class of people, if you will, uh, election officials, local election officials in particular, are amongst uh, the finest of, of any Americans. Um, they come deeply uh, from within their own communities with their own sort of uh, political biases, um, but you don't know what they are. Uh, they, they treat this with the utmost level of respect, uh, the institution. Uh, you look at Wisconsin, the, the 1,800 of them, they're all uh, there today and have been. Um, there's lots of public stories right now about the election officials who are uh, working through this uh, process as critical infrastructure are, are facing the same um, sort of catastrophic illness that uh, the rest of the, the, the folks are. You know, looking towards November, um, they will put their heads down uh, no matter what is what they're called upon to do. Um, I think it's incumbent about decision makers um, to not ask them to do the impossible, uh, to position them to succeed, uh, to make decisions not just on funding now, but on um, any, any rule and, and law changes. Uh, settle that now so it doesn't have to be uh, settled in the courts. Uh, settle it fairly, um, and and this election will go off and, and be one for the history books. I think that's actually a perfect uh, way to end this thing. So I think you know one of these panels sometimes become rather dire, but but knowing that there are uh, well-minded and well-meaning uh, local election officials who, despite a pandemic, despite uh, foreign threats, who are actually